Welcome to Living Free Today, a ministry of Cornerstone Fellowship in San Lorenzo, California. These podcasts are the weekly sermons of Dr. Michael L. Wilson. I'd like to wish you all a happy Mother's Day. If you are not a mother, you had one or have one. And therefore, we have all been touched in some way that may be considered miraculous, may be considered magical, may definitely be considered influential by a mother somewhere and a mother's love, whether you are related to that mother or not. For my mother spoke into my life for all my formative years about God but also many of the women of this church, some that are still here, did the same and raised me up in the knowledge and the practice of Jesus Christ. And I just want to thank you for all of your influences on your children and other children's that have come across your path. If you would turn with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy was written by Paul. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ that was saved on the road to Damascus. He was a persecutor of the faith. And Jesus literally knocked him off his horse so that he could see the truth of Jesus Christ and it be revealed to him. As was the practice back then as it is today... Leaders in the church would have disciples, and Timothy was one of Paul's disciples. We get the sense from Scripture that Timothy was uh, Paul's favorite disciple since he spoke of him more often than any other person in his life. And so in his second letter, Paul is writing to Timothy as Timothy is uh, a pastor by this time. He is probably the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And so when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he is writing to Timothy's church. He wrote two letters, 1 and 2 Timothy, to uh, the pastor of that church. And in doing so, he is revealing how Timothy came to the Lord. And that is something that we shall look at today. When we look at mothers and think about Mother's Day, we think about how God made mothers and how God gave them a special place and special ability. It has been said that mothers have the best x-ray vision, able to see through walls and see into the hearts of their children to tell what is really going on. That Mothers have the best multitasking that any CEO would be jealous of that people have thought if we can bottle the energy of mothers, we are able to power any household for any length of time. We are able to power any business for any length of time, and we would be able to manage all the traffic of this world just with the organizational skills of a mother. Mothers are cooks, teachers, medical professionals, chauffeurs, maids, and wives. They are the ministers in a home that keeps the family before the throne and altar of God. And mothers, historically, are the greatest intercessors for their children and for their family. When it is all said and done... And we are looking back on the history of this world standing before God. I believe God will reveal a special place for the mothers of this world who are able to keep the gospel alive even in the most difficult situations. It has been said that a father might coach a young boy from the very young age, teaching them to dribble a basketball and to shoot. They will convert the driveway into a basketball court and spend all evening hours teaching that son how to shoot, trying to create an NBA star. They will push that son and push that son. And when it is all said and done and their skill is recognized by the high school coach and eventually the college coach and that son eventually wins 
the state championship or the national championship and a microphone is pressed into their face, their first words will be, Hi, Mom. Mothers have a special place in the hearts of their children. And so Paul writes in 2 Timothy, and if we look in verse 5, after he does his introductory remarks, he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Paul, when he first got saved, he was saved, uh, we do not know, maybe around 40, 42 or something A.D. Jesus Christ had already been crucified, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven by the time Paul was saved. And one of the first things he did is he teamed up with Barnabas, and they did missionary journeys that are called. There are three missionary journeys that are described of Paul in the book of Acts, and from those he planted churches, and that is why he wrote letters like Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, to these churches that he had planted. And at that time, we know from Acts 16, that at that time, uh, Lois and Eunice, the uh, mother and grandmother of Timothy lived in a place called Lystra. Lystra is in Asia Minor, and Paul went through that area around 48 A.D., and he planted churches in Lystra, and he planted churches around that time. And when Paul first hit Lystra in that area, it is believed Timothy had not been born yet or Timothy was just an infant. So Paul planted a church and went out and did street preaching and called people in. And these two women, Lois and Eunice, came to the church and accepted Jesus Christ. They were the grandmother and mother of Timothy. And then Paul spent some time there setting up leadership and then he moved on to plant churches in other places. And when he came around again many years later to visit these churches, then Timothy apparently had been born and Paul took him under his wing as a, as a young man new to the gospel because he saw something in Timothy, he saw something that was sincere and great and simple in Timothy, and he credited that to the witness and the upbringing of Timothy's grandmother and mother. Even in those days, you, you had wars and you had things going on between countries, and whenever a a king or a emperor would go to war, they would conscript, conscript the people of the country and they would conscript the men almost exclusively and the Romans would exclusively bring men into the army and you could volunteer in order to get special privileges, but that usually was not enough people. The the military would go from town to town and pick people and say, you will join the army. And an average enlistment in the Roman army was 25 years. And so today we say, well, back when we had the draft, you could be drafted for two to three years. If you volunteer today, you'll put in four to join the Roman army was 25, and you became a very rich and, and almost uh, aristocratic person who would survive that long in the military and who would be able to exit and retire. Your retirement would be very strong. And while the Romans were trying to conquer the world, and even in the 40s A.D., they were still 
conquering sections of the world, all the men of a certain town like Lystra would be removed. Only the very young and the very old would remain. Everybody else in your 20 to 40 range would be taken by force by the Roman army and forced to fight battles in foreign lands to gain land and taxes for the Roman government. And so who was left behind? Who was left behind would be the women and the young children. And the options that were were had was that the women could band together and and form a community uh, following the Roman gods or following whatever was necessary to gain favor from the Romans. But when Paul came through, he presented a different way. He said, Jesus Christ came and he died for your sins. And he rose again that if you believe in him, you will have eternal life and you don't have to work for this. You don't have to strive for this. And so... Lois and Eunice, the grandmother and mother of Timothy, took this and said there is, there is greater wealth, as it were, in teaching young Timothy about Jesus Christ and bringing him up in the knowledge of Jesus Christ so that when he, when he reached 20, and they had this view, which was a correct view, that when he reached 20, he would be drafted into the Roman army. They, know, they knew that he would be able to go and go with the faith in Jesus Christ that if anything happened in foreign lands, he would be saved and they would meet him in heaven. And so we can think that it was a, an insurance policy in some ways, but also they saw something because Paul saw something. When Paul came through... The second time it says in 2 Timothy that he laid hands on Timothy, that he saw something, and laying hands was a way of of conferring power or conferring a calling that that people could, could gain a position if hands were laid on people. And it is done today with with ordination and even baptism before. Missionaries go out to other lands. Churches will gather around and lay hands on them as kind of a symbolic conferring of power. And this was done to Timothy. And that was seen as something miraculous. And so they trained him up. These new Christians who didn't have a copy of the Bible, who just knew what was told to them by Paul, was able to raise him up. And so 2 Timothy was probably written when Timothy was about 35. We still don't know the dates exactly about this, but he was an adult. And whatever had happened with the military, either he was able to move around or maybe he had a limp, we don't know, but the Roman army didn't want him. And so he was able to dedicate his life to becoming a full-time pastor and eventually be put in Ephesus. And so Paul credits his faith and his calling, calling back to the women that were in his life, that it is not the men, that it is not a church, but it is the women Paul also talks about the deep conviction that they had and the deep conviction that this faith is true to to in many ways risk the, the ridicule of the town that had Roman gods in them to to raise up Timothy in the faith. And what we can what we can see from this is that. Paul is talking about what we call an intergenerational faith, that you have a grandmother who taught a daughter, who taught a son, and then that son, we are sure, got married because that's what they did back then, and they had as many kids as they could, 
I'm sure Timothy raised up his kids in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He, he, as a pastor of a church, was able to lead not only the town of Ephesus, but also raise his children. And of course, there's, there's no guarantee that when you have Christian parents that the children will be uh, saved in that way. There is always a prayer, there is always a prayer of every parent that the children will become believers and they will grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. When you look at how I came to be, not that I am anything like Timothy, but I was able to look at old pictures this week, trying to prepare some things to perhaps show my mother, and I was reminded of uh, my grandmother on my mother's side and her husband meeting and getting married in San Francisco and having a daughter and having a son in San Francisco and then moving to Redwood City and how Russell Colvin, the, the, my grandfather on my mother's side, was a very godly man raised my mother in the church, was very close friends with Ray Stedman, who you may have known, who started the Christian Businessmen's Association and Peninsula Bible Church. And my grandfather was very involved in those things that every time the church doors were open, he brought his family to church and then he was stricken by ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, leaving my grandmother and her children to be alone. And my grandmother continued in the faith. When my grandmother passed away, we were able to find her Bible that had marks all over it and notes all over it that this Bible with, with post-it notes and bulletin pieces taped inside the Bible, that this was clearly her anchor raising her daughter. It was clearly her anchor raising her family alone, knowing that what was in that book, what was in the Word of God, had to be transferred and had to be given to her children. And then when my uncle, my mother's brother, was killed, it was only my grandmother and my mother, and they supported each other in the faith in many ways. And then in high school, my mother met my dad, and then the rest is history. My dad, uh, very involved in the church, very raised in the church. His parents were raised in the church. And when I would visit my grandparents on either side, and it was over a Sunday, we would always find ourselves in church that there was an influence from generation to generation to generation of, of these godly people training up the next generation in the things of God, teaching them about what is going on with the Bible and having a favorite Bible that is, that is written in and studied and as has been said, if, you're, if you find somebody whose Bible is falling apart, the chances are their life is not. The Bible is what holds us together, and, and when we found the, the Bibles of these grandparents, and they're now all in a box in my attic of grandparents and great-grandparent Bibles, and they're, they're just a history of how people have loved God and told their kids, and their grandkids were told, and their great-grandkids were told, until you reach a place where the gospel is being told by one of those who became a pastor. If you look at Janelle's family, she has pastors galore in her ancestry, that there is a sense that it is passed on from generation to generation. And that is what God does to bring people up so that from a very young age, people have the opportunity 
to learn about Jesus and to grow up in that faith that is happening, it seems, less and less. And of course, it doesn't happen anywhere in the world. But it is a great thing when you can look at the history of somebody like my wife or me or Timothy and see for generations God has been speaking into them so that the faith is not only something that I know, but it is a family faith. It is a faith that I know I will see my dad and I will see all my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and all my great-grandparents and all these people that I heard stories of. I will see them in heaven because their knowledge of the gospel has been given down from age to age. When you have that level of understanding of the gospel and whether it is starting with you, a generational knowledge of the gospel doesn't have to, you don't have to go way back. Got to remember, Eunice was born before Christ died on the cross, or Lois was before Christ died on the cross. They were the start of a generational Christianity. And even today in churches all across America, there are people who are putting a stake in the ground and leaving the old life. And as young couples are coming to the new life, they are starting with a generational path and mothers are at the core of that. Because even today, even though all of our Men don't go off to war anymore, per se. It is the mothers who have the influence, who carry, who feed, who read to the children of today. And it is the mothers who are the ones who can keep that going. And so today, for the mothers that are here, I praise God for your faith. I pray that you will be able to Spread it not only down your own line, but to others in your life, that they may see the strength of your faith. That on Mother's Day, it is not a celebration of how great mothers are per se. It is a celebration of how great God has made mothers, and how God is moving mothers along, and how God is putting in their hearts the love for God and the love for their children, that hopefully it will be moved from generation to generation. This is Mother's Day, and I wish to wish you a happy Mother's Day. Let us pray. Dear Lord, bless every mother and every grandmother with the finest of your spiritual blessing today. Confirm in their hearts and spirits the work of her hands and the love that she has so freely given to those children under your care. Validate her worth daily so that she has no reason to doubt whether she is loved, valued, and cherished in the eyes of her Heavenly Father. Create in her a deep sense of your protection and trust so that worry and fear will disappear as she places her loved ones into your care. Let her know that every prayer she has prayed and every encouragement word, encouraging word she has spoken on behalf of her children and grandchildren has been transformed into sweet, fragrant offerings before your throne. Whisper deep within her spirit the sweet words she longs to hear from you, that nothing can ever separate her from your love. Help her to nestle daily into the promise of your word, standing with faith on the things you declare are true. Let her know that you reward faithfulness, but that true success doesn't lie in her accomplishments or accolades. Let her rest in the knowledge that she has done all she can and that she and those she loves truly belong to you. Bless her with a servant spirit so she can teach her own the joy of hearing one day, well done. Remove any guilt, faults or real, and replace them with your amazing grace and forgiveness. Help her see her children or grandchildren through your eyes, knowing that in your hands is the safest place they can ever be. 
calm every doubt, and strengthen her confidences in the only one who can bring good out of any situation. Teach her that she cannot meet every need in her child's life, but that you can. Give her wisdom and guidance to train those precious children in your path, and then to leave the results to you, Lord. Help her to love without limitations, to pray without ceasing, and to live without regrets. Bless her with such a sweet dependency on you that she will acknowledge her inadequacies, yet recognize and accept your reward of praise and your sense of pleasure in having her as your own beloved child. Where, pr where prayers may still seem unanswered and dreams are not yet realized, open her eyes to see beyond this world to a hope that never disappoints and to a father who will never leave or abandon her. Give her courage to persevere even in the most difficult moments of her life. Bless her with honesty, integrity, and a playfulness that shows her children she is human yet unswerving in her desires to know you. Let her joy be contagious, let her passions be pure, and let her life overflow with all the blessings she deserves on special days and on every day of her life. Through the blood of Christ I pray, amen. Cornerstone Fellowship is located at 180 Llewellyn Boulevard, San Lorenzo, California. Our Sunday morning service is at 1045 a.m. Our website is livingfreetoday.org and our phone number is 510-278-2622. May God continue to bless you as you serve your King. God bless.